All right, thank you so much, guys. Uh, wasn't the first session just powerful and amazing? Oh, come on, that was so good. I truly, truly enjoyed it. And for me, it's like the more I'm hearing this conversation, the more uh, it's making sense to me. And so maybe you're here for the first time. Maybe you're here, you've not been uh, had this conversation before. My call to you is not to discount it. My call to you is to lean in a little bit more and just listen to what God is saying as we unpack uh, the message uh, uh, that the, the, the Managa uh, is sharing with us. One of the things that uh, Pastor M shared uh, that I thought was powerful is about uh, that it's fun to win wars, yeah? Uh, and, and he's saying that, you know, already we've been winning some wars, but he's, as, as we continue to do this, there are some things that God will start doing among us. And my prayer is to be there. My prayer is to be in, that, in the midst of that battlefield and to see what God will continue to do in our midst. Two quick announcements. Number one, uh, uh, if you missed T, we apologize. We apologize. Um, we apologize to you. Uh, for now, there is enough water in the house. You have to promise what you don't have tea is tea bags and sugar, but the rest, water is enough. So you can get some tea at the back. No, it's, it's a joke though. But those who missed, we apologize for that. Um, I, I think there will be enough lunch though. Number two, uh, it's a thought. I also think there will be enough lunch, but you can share. Number two, uh, we have people who are doing our Fearless Institute. That is our one-year leadership development program, uh, part of which you get to write a book. Now, there are people at the back with their books, all right? Uh, there are others at the back. Uh, they, now, they won't be in, when Pastime is, you know, sharing and all that, they will be seated. But during breaks, kindly pass through there, uh, see some of their books, buy a book or two, uh, give to someone, uh, uh, you know, share with someone. I think that would be a good thing if we promoted the people of this house. Uh, and then, if you didn't register, if you came in, maybe you used one of the other gates, but you didn't get to register with the, with the registration desk, kindly let me request you to go at the back uh, where the, the team at the back is and register there. If you haven't registered, do it.
network of churches. They sort of uh, oversee a network of churches. And those churches then, uh, eventually, God willing, will also oversee networks of their own of churches. So what we're doing in discipleship, we're also doing in church. Uh, just the same way that a person will disciple a person, so even a church will disciple uh, churches as well. Uh, so then uh, next to them is Pastor Ndachi. He's not with Pastor Yvette, but he's here. He's a good man. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Hiya, oh, yeah, the rest of you sit so that we know who Pastor Ndachi is. Uh, so Pastor Ndachi leads uh, Mavuno, uh, Lovington and the Associated uh, Churches that go with that. Pastor Ndachi and I were actually in primary school together, same class. Uh, and we've just we've been friends for many many years. He's just a seasoned pastor, just has a lot a lot of passion uh, for God's word, and so we really honor you, Pastor Ndachi. Yeah. Amen. Uh, and then next to them is Pastor Angie and Pastor Nick. <laughs> Amen. And uh, they are such amazing people. They lead uh, Mavuno South and the network of churches associated with that. And uh, God has just given them a family that's very international. They have churches in different countries as well. And uh, they are passionate. I mean, they are the pastors of love, I think. Eh? Yeah. Like, I know there are people who compete for that, that crowd, but I think they, these guys really go out of their way to love their people. Uh, and disciple, they really do love discipleship as well. Pastor Nick has a real, he has a way with men. Uh, God has just given a, a gift to disciple men as well. And so we honor you guys and thank you for the work that you do. We love you. Yeah. <laughs> So, so each of these, like I said, leads a network of churches. Now, one of the things that was a shift for me when I started doing families, I say to them, to the pastors around me, I can no longer, if I'm your father, then I can't be the father of you. I need to be the father of your spouse as well. And so I said, I, Car Pastor Caro and I need to disciple you as a family. And so that's why it's a shift. When we're a corporate, in a board of directors, you don't see wives sitting next to the husbands or CEOs. But we're not a corporate, we're a family. And that's why, for me, I really believe that we are called to family ministry. And my prayer is that there will be families serving in Mavuno Church. Some of you, your husbands are not believers. They will become believers and pastors in this church. In Jesus' name, we will serve, you will serve together because that's the anointing in this house, uh, that, that families grow together and serve together. And what we're learning uh, from Uganda is even our children will serve. That's what we'll... Our children, Pastor Sean. Amen. That's Pastor Kilonzi's son, Pastor Sean. Uh, we already know he's going to lead the next generation of Mavuno uh, leaders. So, so thank you guys. Uh, these, these are our leaders. And really, like, the Bible talks about the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And I believe that these are the foundation that God has given us in this season. Uh, I'll just give a very special mention to uh, somebody that many of you don't know, uh, Pastor Martin. Uh, if you could just stand and wave. Uh, this is Pastor Martin. Pastor Martin is the pastor of Mavuno Mombasa. So now you know who you're clapping for. And uh, the Lord is just so gracious. Him and his wife have been leading. A, 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 they just started from scratch. Uh, no, no history with Mavuno uh, there. And they basically just gr a, brought a group of people together, started doing Mizizi. And right now their community is about 100 people. And they're just getting ready to launch in the new year. Oh, Pastor Sheila is not here. Actually, I've just, that's, I was calling people as I saw them. Uh, but th that's a, the other person I should have introduced, Pastor Sheila and Pastor Albu. Uh, I don't see them, but they are in absentia. I'll introduce them in absentia. Uh, they are right now uh, acting leadership of Mavuno Mashariki and the network of churches there. Uh, they're standing in for Pastor Milton and Vivian. Uh, who are on sabbatical until the end of the year uh, and who are, who are the ones who actually lead that network. Pastor Sheila actually leads our operations. Uh, but in this, in this, in this uh, what is it called, in this battleship, everyone is ev can do everything. So when Pastor Milton went to sabbatical, we asked her, can you lead the church? So she's both doing operations and leading the church as well. And, and there she is. <laughs> Pastor Sheila! There she is, an amazing woman. We bless God for her. Thank you, Pastor Sheila. We, we were, we were boast, I was boasting about you. Is, is, is Pastor Abu around? No, he had a gig. He had a gig, okay. So he, he runs events, so I know Saturdays tends to be very crazy days for him. Uh, but I know you're, is Ashley around? Yes, she is. Uh, okay, so she's, Ashley is right there. <laughs> All right. So Ashley is their daughter, 
and she's another next generation Mavuno pastor. So we bless God for her. Yeah. Amen. So, boy, it's so much fun when you start doing ministry as a family. Like, I think for me, my prayers are just, I like my children should do what I do. Because I love God. And I'm impacting the world. Why should I want my children to impact the world and love God? You know? That's the beauty of doing ministry as a family. It stops being a Sunday thing. It stops being something I do occasionally. It becomes my life. And we become a family on mission. Everything we do supports our ministry. You know, as a Christian, that's the reason you're on earth. You're on earth to do ministry. You're on earth to actually bring people to the kingdom and to build God's kingdom. And then to go to heaven and continue doing that for the rest of eternity. And when the devil trips us up and he makes us forget what our agenda is. So we start chasing gold with everybody else. Not understanding the Bible tells us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things will be added. So that job you have is those other things. That career you do, that you do, eight, that's, that's, those are those other things. God is adding them to you, but he's adding them to you so that you can do what? Seek the kingdom. Those are tools. And I think for me, that's the thing. I feel like the devil really trips us up because we pray and somebody gets that job which is supposed to help them pursue the kingdom and what do they do now? They start running in Karura on Saturdays. On Sundays, they can't come to church because they are so stressed with this job that God, that, God gave, that God gave them. What is that? This is just a little job. God gave it to you. He can even give you bigger things. We, we can't forget our identity. Your identity is as part of the family of God and a soldier in the army of Jesus. Amen. That's who we are. So I want to talk about serving as a family. So today I'm going to, I, I, I just, I, I want to hone in a bit on this theme of serving uh, because I think it's so important for us. And we said if you want to change the world, if you want to leave a legacy that outlives you, it's your you have to build a family. And my prayer is every one of you will have children Amen. that you will say, because of me, that person is great. Because of me, this person is great. Because of me, this, this person is changing the world because of me. Uh, and I think that's the greatness of a parent. You can achieve great things, but if your children are nothing, you're nothing. Because you have no legacy. Nothing will, nobody will remember you. So the greatness of a person is defined by their greatness after they're gone. Who continues with your name after you're gone? So whatever organization you're running right now, this is not just church stuff. This is life stuff. Uh, you must start something that has a legacy that carries on in the hearts of the people that you're, you're leading. And the only way to do that is by building a family. Now, it's interesting. That's what Jesus did. He had three years. And I think of Jesus, I'm very challenged because he did everything he was supposed to do on earth in three years and at the end he said it is finished. It's like done. <laughs> he was so effective, all it took was three years. Me, I've been in ministry for 15 years and I'm still like, okay, Lord, not yet. Don't call me home yet. There's still some work I need to do. But Jesus was done in three years. But what did he do? When you think about it, he spent 80% of his time building a family. If you look at his teachings, 80% of his time was spent with his disciples. Yes, he talked to crowds. Yes, he healed them. Yes, he, they came to see him. But you know what? Even the crowds, he did it on, with his disciples in mind. It was, it was training for them to see what to do. And many times, he actually did not even teach the crowds so the crowds would understand. <laughs> it's like he was teaching them so the disciples could understand. Because after he taught them, then he'd go and tell the disciples, now let me tell you what I was teaching. Why didn't he break it down to everybody? Because he knew his family is what mattered. And he knew if I get it right with these guys, the world will change. Wow. That's a very, very different way of thinking, isn't it? Because many people want a crowd. They think the effectiveness of our ministry is filling a church with many people, preaching to them every Sunday, not understanding that's not a Jesus model. Jesus model is about the family. So who are you building and who are you pouring your life into? Uh, there's, there's this, I, I think it's in Matthew chapter 13, where it says, uh, he, he explains to his disciples, the disciples came to him, verse 10, uh, and they said, why do you speak to people in parables? And he said, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Hmm. Wow, that is so exclusive. Like, I'd feel so left out if I was the 13th guy who was almost called, and 12 were called. He's like, why, why, are they, why them? Why, why not me? But you know, Jesus knew, if I get these guys right, they will get you right. So for me, I pour into my executive team. I know if I get them right, Mavuno has a future. So I pour into them. So the question is, who are you pouring into? Who are the people that God has given you or will give you that you will pour into and that if you get them right, your legacy is assured? Like you will be able to say after that, it is finished. Lord, I can even go home now. I'm done. By the way, the streets of, gold are made, uh, the streets of heaven are made of gold. Do you realize that? 
All you guys who are chasing Bitcoin and chasing go, I mean, we're chasing money. In heaven, money will be what we walk on. It's cabro, it's, it's that. So it's, it's just a tool for me to do God's work, not to get caught up and make it uh, my, my God. So the greatest barriers to being a family, that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about some of the barriers that will keep us from being a family. And as you raise your family, this is important for you because as you're discipling your discipleship group, you're leading your ministry team, you will need to know these barriers because these barriers are really, really uh, family destroying. But in addition to that, as part of a discipleship group yourself, as you're being discipled, you want to analyze and see, do I have these barriers myself? These barriers actually operate in our lives as Christians and many times unknown to us. In addition to that, they also operate in our physical families. So you're going to find that even as you're building a family, you're married, you're trying to bring up children, or you have siblings and you're trying to, to strengthen that family, that you will find that these barriers also operate there. And when you know what they are, you can actually do something about them. So that's what I want to teach you. So are you ready for this? Yeah. So, so you have to have, I hope you're taking notes because this stuff is going to be, it's, this is going to be stuff that actually helps you. And let me tell you this, I've been a leader now for <laughs> many years, maybe 30 years. Uh, and the crazy thing is this stuff, it, to me, it's revolutionary stuff. It's like stuff I thought I knew, but I didn't know. So as I'm teaching it to you, it's something that is changing my life right now. I thought I knew. And this stuff has come from studying, because what I said is I was following Bill Hybels. I was following Rick Warren. I was following the proponents of church growth theory. Who are the people that I was trained by? When I went to Fuller Seminary, that's the people who ran that school are the people who founded a lot of the theories that run the church today. Uh, there's a man called Peter Wagner, if you Google him, and he's one of the, f the, the founders of church growth theory. Those are the guys who made the mega church possible. Uh, they taught how to do outreach. And they, they, so I was taught under those people. I can say like at the Apostle Paul, I sat under Gamaliel's feet. Uh, these are the people who shaped the church and the people who are shaping the church. But you know, when I began to examine the vision God gave us, I realized that our vision is to plant a culture-defining church in every capital city of Africa and the gateway cities of the world by 2035. And here's the thing God helped me see. None of those people that I was studying under, none of those people I was following leads a world-changing movement. None. And think about even the famous pastors that we follow online. The big pastor, the big name U.S. pastors who are influencing the world. None of them is following is, is leading a, a world-changing movement. At the most, the ones who are very successful, they have multiple campuses with a video screen yeah. where it's me being multiplied. Yeah. That was never God's intention. That's not how the church was meant to be. But I didn't know this because I was following. And so God began to help me to follow people who are actually doing what I want to do. Remember we said who you follow is important yeah. because you become like them. And so I began to realize if I want to become, I need to follow people who are leading global, world-changing movements. And we say those movements are where? Nigeria, Nigeria Ghana, Korea, Brazil. They're not, they're not, and soon Kenya. <laughs> Uganda, yeah. I wanted to follow where those people are. And so that's how I began this journey. And so the things I'm teaching you are things that for me have been mind-blowing. I've always talked about wanting to lead a movement, but I've never understood it because I didn't know some of this stuff. If you want to lead a movement, number one, you have to lead a family. That, that thing is just critical. You have to lead a family. Um, McDonald's can be a global franchise, but they do it by paying. They do it through salaries. You can't do that in the church. You can't change the world through paying people. So you need something, a, a deeper driving force. And the, that force is a family. So the bar barriers to a family. Number one, the greatest barrier, and again, see if you can identify some of these in your own families. Number one is an independent spirit. An independent spirit. I'm going to ask um, somebody who's in charge. I like the fact that we opened up the flaps. We could open up a bit more. Eh? It's soon going to start getting nice and warm and cozy. <laughs> and it's Saturday. You know that can up. So just to make sure people don't check out, let's open as much of the flaps as we can. So an independent spirit. As humans, we are naturally independent. And by independent, I really mean rebellious. This is how we are. The Bible tells us that is our condition right from the Garden of Eden. Uh, the devil asked a question. 
Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 to 5, asked Eve, did God say? And then Eve said, yeah, God said. And then the devil said this, you will not certainly die. Hmm. God has said we will die. The, <laughs> the devil said, no, you will certainly not die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good or evil. In other words, the reason God is giving you an instruction is because he wants to keep you down. The reason God is giving you an instruction is because he doesn't want you to be as good as him. God has an agenda and that agenda is not for your good. So you better think for yourself. Think for yourself. Basically, why should someone determine how you live? Why should you yield control of any aspect of your life to somebody else except yourself? What if you end up doing things you don't enjoy? Or you have to give up things that you actually enjoy because of being determined by someone else? And you see, our culture, that's the message of our culture. When you're doing family night with Pastor Angie, she's, she's brilliant, by the way. She's so amazing. I love this woman. And, and she really, I mean, you are just amazing. You're, you're bang on it. Because I hadn't even seen it when you said, but this is the spirit of the age. I thought I was talking about the church and the issues of the church, but she told me, but that's not the church, that's the world. Everybody in the world thinks like that. We've been taught that. All the heroes in our movies are independent thinkers. How many people have watched James Bond? <laughs> like, like, yeah, it's okay, it's, it's okay. The pastor didn't expect you to have watched only The Passion and Sijui, <laughs> The Chosen. <laughs> It's okay. By the way, I like action movies. Huh? I think there's something about guys who are in helping professions. Any guys who are counselors? Not ac accountants, not as much. You know those gentle, gentle roles. Past men who are given gentle, nurturing roles. Because our, our nature is not necessarily, our nature is a bit more conquering. So if your role is just to tell people, oh, God loves you, bless you, you need an outlet. So I must say, when I preach my sermons, when I go home, nothing does it for me like an action movie. The more mindless, the better. Like, I don't want plot lines of relationships to complicate it. Character development, what is that? Just give me action, you know? And the more guys die, the better. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it's just, it's my outlet. It's my outlet, huh? I can see the guys are feeling me. The ladies, are, we don't get this. But, but that's how it is. That's how it is. It's just like, the, in fact, those actions, you know the ones where like 50 things are blown up, then this movie starts. Like the guy has run, he's been cut, he's died, people have died, the thing has blown up, there's a car chase, a boat chase, then the movie starts. You're like, that's the one I want to watch right now. So anyway, if you watch those movies, you're going to find James Bond, that guy never listens to M. He never listens to his boss. His boss is M. I don't know, it's maybe short for Pastor M. But he never, he never listens to his boss. He does what he wants when he wants. And he always succeeds. It's so crazy. It's like, you do this, and he's like, nah, let me show you guys how this thing is done. And he does it, and of course the movie gives you sympathy for him. So you're like, can't they see that he's right? We watch Jack Bauer. Who are those other guys who are action? None of those guys ever follows instructions. They always are independent. The world glorifies independent thinking. And that's a thing, you know, it's like there's something demeaning about following. There's something demeaning about being part of something bigger. It's like be the guy who stands out. Be you. Do you. Hey, is that the message of today? Just do you, man. Don't, why are you trying to be, just do you. There's an independent spirit in the Bible, and his name was Job. Joab was a commander-in-chief, well, the commander of David's army. David was a commander-in-chief, but he, Joab was his commander. And Joab was actually the king's nephew. He was David's nephew. The sister of David was called Zeruiah, and he, he had three sons, and all three sons were, were, were soldiers, and they fought under David. It's a fascinating family story. The army of David was full of war heroes. Uh, all those guys did great exploits. If you've read them, I mean, somebody should actually make talk of action movies. Like, David's life should be an action movie, like many. In fact, it would be a series, like, with season eight. It's like there's so many episodes of just heroic stuff. You don't even have to make it up. Just make it the way the Bible teaches it. But it's interesting because Joab stood out, even among those mighty men. And he became the guy who was the commander-in-chief. But the thing about Joab is he only did things when they suited him. I don't know if you've ever read the story of Joab. You need to read this guy. He's like he was a loyal soldier when it worked for him. And he, when, when he agreed with the instructions, he was the guy. He was right there. 
But when he's like, I, does this king know what he's doing? I'm not sure I'm feeling this story. So guess what Joab did? When David um, finally had won the war against Saul, and David made peace with Saul's commander, the, the, the girl of the commander of Saul's army. And David was like, Let, these guys are Israelites. Let's embrace them. We don't want a civil war. Let's just, so he had a, a meeting with him. They had a feast. They made even a, a, a covenant. Joab comes back into town and hears that David did that. And he's like, what the heck? Does my boss even know what he's doing? And he, the other crazy thing is that guy had actually killed Joab's brother. But it wasn't out of cold blood. It was in a war. And actually, it's a young brother who instigated this guy. The guy even warned him, but he still chased him. But Joab had a grudge. So guess what Joab does? He, calls, he, he sends a message, tells him, dude, there's something the king needs to, I was told to tell you. So he comes close to him, and he comes to whisper. He grabs him by his beard, and he stabs him. Like, let me tell you, the stories in the Bible are just like, whoa, like treachery, you know. And then he just goes back, and it's good. Um, he's a powerful guy. He makes the, the king has to apologize, by the way. Huh? This is so crazy when I read it, because I'm thinking, how do you let this guy get away with this? The second time was Absalom. Absalom rebelled, was David's son, and he rebelled against David, caused a civil war. And David gave an express command. When we are fighting them, because it now came down to a war between him and his son and their forces, he said, please, whatever you do, spare this young man's life. Nobody kills him. Absalom finally, because he used to have long hair, he was, oh, those guys used to impress girls, he used to do like this. He had, he had locks. <laughs> so, but he, those locks became his undoing because he rode under a tree and the locks caught him. So he's just hanging there under his dreadlocks. Uh, he's, he's, he's just hanging and they find him. And of course the soldier, sol Job says, kill him. And the soldier says, the king said we don't kill him. Job is like, what is this? He takes, the Bible says he takes three darts. And he's just like, <laughs> it's like playing darts. <laughs> And just kills the guy. Cold blood. And it's the king's son. And I'm sure in his mind he's thinking, this king doesn't know. This boy will rebel again. I know him. This one will just cause problems. This king has no clue what he's ordering. Anyway, let me just sort out for him. He'll thank me later. That's an independent spirit. Let's do it, but let's do it my way. After that, there's another one, by the way. It's not, there are three deaths like that, isn't it? Um, there's another death where I think it was a guy called, what's he called? Or oh, it starts with O. Oh. There's a the time David got tired of him, and so he appointed another guy to be the commander-in-chief. It, it wasn't, Abner was the first guy he killed. So, Amasa, yes, I was, I was thinking of Sama, but it was, a, it was Amasa. And Amasa, thank you, there are some guys who read the Bible here. Well done, you've been reading through the scripture. I love that. And so Amasa is appointed. Guess what Job does? He just goes into <laughs> default mode. Calls him for a meeting. Whispers, whispers some things. Again, leans near, grabs his beard. <laughs> and the king, and then he, then he takes the mission, because the guy has been given a mission by the king to go and fight a war. He takes the mission, calls the soldiers, goes and wins the war. And comes and tells the king, we won. <laughs> so he's doing what he's supposed to be doing, but he's doing it on whose terms? His terms. There's a time when David, you wonder what David was doing, but it's interesting because there's a time, David actually said, um, he said in 2 Samuel chapter 3, he said in verse 39, he said, Today, though I am the anointed king, I am weak, and these sons of Zeruiah are too strong for me. Like his leader became too strong for him to control. So the only thing that kept Job next to him is that Job and his interests were aligned. But Job was there to do his thing. He wasn't there to do David's thing. That's an independent spirit. Just ask your neighbor, do you have an independent spirit? <laughs> you know, an independent spirit is someone who belongs to a family or to a church or to an organization, but they only do what he wants. She only does, she's there to do what she wants. The pastor says, we are fasting on Thursdays. And the guy says, I, Thursday, me, I go to the gym on Thursdays. <laughs> That didn't work for me. So me, I'll fast, but you guys fast on Thursday. I'll pick, I'll pick my date. We're praying at 4.30. Man, it's for an hour. What's the problem? Huh? You guys prayed, huh? <laughs> but he does what he wants. The leader calls for a meeting, and he actually asks, how important is this meeting? And then he says, okay, this one I think will work. I think I should be there because I need to say something. But this other one, I'm busy. What do you say? Some people, I can hear pastors with pain. Uh -huh. what do, 
It, that should have just been an email. Why are you calling me for a meeting? I, can you hear pain over here? <laughs> I'm, hearing, I'm hearing tears. Not, they sound like laughter, but they're not. So when this person is asked to do something, it's like, does it work for me? For independent people, participation in the family is at their own convenience. Nobody tells them what to do. Now, the crazy thing is, despite what the world teaches us, independent spirits are bad for any family and any organization. Trust me, Jack Bauer is a myth. There are no people like that. He doesn't exist. James Bond is a myth. Those guys who break orders and then they get promoted, it doesn't work anywhere in the world. There's no army that can work like that and still succeed. The U.S. Army is one of the most disciplined militaries there is. You try and do what that guy does, you will be so fired and court-martialed, your bum will be in a prison for the rest of your life. You won't even know what hit you. This is Hollywood lying to us and trying to cheat us about this thing being a good thing. It's not a good thing. It will destroy your family. It will destroy your organization. A family full of independent thinkers will not go far. It's, this thing, this, it's not saying that we shouldn't think for ourselves. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying we should become zombies and just do what we are told. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, when somebody asks me that, I say, because some, someone even asked me, Pastor, are you saying we should just become zombies? Are you just saying we shouldn't even ask a question what we are told? And I actually said, the, the real answer I gave them was, I said, well, yes and no. And I said, yes for a certain reason. I'll tell you why they're yes. Because you know Galatians 2.20, this person had done Mizizi. And it says what? I've been crucified with Christ. I the big eye of independence, I no longer live, but who lives? Christ lives in me. So I said, because of that reason, for sure, you are a zombie. Because when Jesus says jump, you ask when you're up in the air, how high? You don't even ask before you jump. That's the way it's meant to be. That's the soldier that you've, been, you've become when you give your life to Jesus. But then I say to them, when it comes to your church or to spiritual authorities, there is always, and every army has a precedence of authority. If your pastor asks you to jump and Jesus does not say jump or it, is, it goes against what the scripture teaches, then what you have to do is say, there's always, I defer to the high authority. That's how the family works. That's how a family works. That's how an army works. And so you're able to say like the, the, the apostles, they were told by the Jewish council, the leaders of the Jewish religion, the people they respected. Even Jesus, when, I think it was Jesus who was slapped for speaking to, against the high priest, and then he said, I, if I knew to... No, it wasn't Jesus, it was Paul. He was slapped, and he said, how dare you speak against the high priest? And he said, I didn't know it was a high priest. Because even he would not speak in a way that would dishonor the high priest of God's people. But when the apostles were told by the, those priests, do not speak again in the name of this Jesus. They said, do you remember what they said? They said, you judge for yourself whether it is right for me to obey God or to obey you. So there's always a precedence of authority. But they did that very respectfully, isn't it? Because they didn't come in to just show their independent. They're like, look, there's a higher authority than yourself in this case. So you don't, it, it's not saying that you become a zombie, but it's saying, listen, take the word your pastor gives, go and read the scripture. If it is God's word indeed, do it. And do it quickly. Your only justification for disobedience is when you're asked to do something contrary to God's will. So that's a spirit of independence, and it's dangerous. If you have independent disciples, they will destroy your group. They will infect the rest of the disciples. They will create something that you're not, they will not create a family. Now, in every family, they're independent, and I, I must confess, and my wife would not allow me to get away with, say, with not saying this. I think my brother might be in the crowd, so I'd also, I, I need to be accountable here. I was an independent child. I was that child who did not play with my family, with my siblings. I was that child who just sort of created my own path. I think my siblings were all closer. And I was that guy who just left home early. I was the first boy, <laughs> Umoja, <laughs> SQ, <laughs> hustling. But it wasn't that. It was really that I just, I just felt different. I just felt like I could do it without my family. And later on, I really regretted it. Because I felt like there are things that I could have had opportunities to speak into that I didn't start speaking into my family's life until very late. Now, by God's grace, thank God for a second chance. Uh, God has given us a new relationship. I feel like we're close now, and I feel like I have space to speak into the spiritual life of my family. I've had some good conversations with my brother and said, hey, here's something you should do. And he's listened because he allows me that space now. 
Amen. He's there. Amen. <laughs> Amen. He, do, he does. And I love him very much. And I thank God that I'm no longer the independent person in the family. Independence is not good for your family. Actually, one day it struck me, if my parents died, we would not have a family. Because I, who are supposed to be lead, giving leadership after that, I'm not there to lead my siblings. And I, and I repented before God. And my family can tell you, today we, are, we, we, we do what we can to bring people together. We love that. We try and bring holidays. We, we're not perfect, but we give up. We, we understand we have a place to play, a role to play. Independence destroys family. If you're independent in your family, let me urge you to reconsider it. You probably are a hindrance to what God wants for that family. You cannot bring people to Christ if you're independent of them, if you act as if you're better than them. Somehow you have to be a servant in the house for people to see Jesus in you. So independence is not good for the family. Number two, the second uh, thing that harms families is a spirit of offense. A spirit of offense. This one is important, guys. Matthew chapter 13, verse 54 to 58. Coming to his hometown, this is Jesus, he began teaching the people in their synagogue and they were amazed. So Jesus has been out there doing miracles. He's done amazing things. Then he comes to his hometown and he starts to teach and people are amazed. You're thinking they're amazed because he's so incredible. My goodness, this, this guy is just doing such amazing things. No, that's not why they're amazed. Here's why they're amazed. They asked, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? They asked. They're not, it's not that, like, why? Where? We know you. <laughs> Let's move to the next verse. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Fundi Wambao. The, the carpenter. You know, by the way, that's not, they don't even say, isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this the carpenter? You know, by the way, in a synagogue, the carpenter was not an important person. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Like, we know this dude. Isn't his mother's name Mary? <laughs> it's like, is that that woman? Mary. Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? It's like, basically, don't we know you? What are you showing us? And then next verse, uh, aren't all his sisters with us? In other words, how special are you and yet your sisters just live here? <laughs> we know you. We know your dreams. Some of you, we even were here when you're growing up. Who are you? Where did this man get these things? And then the last verse, very, very powerful. They, <laughs> look at that. And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own town and his own house. And then verse 58. Verse 58 is the one that really is amazing for me. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. This is a, the maker of the universe, the creator of all things, the word from the beginning. He had power to do all things, but he could not do all things in his own hometown because God works through faith. That's the way God created the world, isn't it? God created the world that it is our faith that activates his power. He, he limited himself to our faith. He could have done anything he wanted, but he said, no, I give you dominion on this planet. That's why we pray, by the way. Do you know that? The reason you pray is not because you're reminding God or because you're begging God. It's because through prayer, you're saying, may your kingdom come on earth. You're creating a portal for heaven to happen on earth. God has said, I will not do anything on earth except through human agency. That's the power God has given us. That's why David marvels and says, what is man that you're mindful of him? What is humanity that you're so, you've given us so much power? So, so Jesus could do nothing because these guys had taken offense and thus he had no authority in their lives. Now, let me say this. Families are made up of humans and humans are far from perfect. Humans will cause pain. Humans will cause injury. Humans will hurt one another. The church is no exception. You know, when I was young and I was a young leader, I used to look at people who are older leaders, who have many people who are against them and who say they were hurt. And I used to wonder, seriously? Like, man, just have a pure heart and serve God. Like, how do you hurt people, man? Like, like what? So you just love God. This mumble of politics and whatever, just love God. Just love God. What? <laughs> Let me just tell you 20-year-olds, shock on you. The, the higher you go up in leadership, the more opportunity you will have to hurt people. 
people will be hurt by you, not because of anything you did, but because of what you represent. Yeah, it's just the truth. You will come and preach a sermon as Pastor M, and somebody will be offended because their father offended them, and the look you gave them was the look their father gave them. And that person will be an enemy of you. They just decide you're, you don't like them anymore. You will make a point, and you're, by the way, let me tell you, when you look at a crowd like this, yes, you see people, but generally you're carried up with your point. And the person will say, Kwanzaa, when you made that point, you're looking at me. <laughs> what? Let me tell you today, if I told you, just give me a list of all the people who have a Pastor M offense. I am so humble. There are many. You know, the only thing that comforts me is because there's no great pastor who has a short list. There's nobody. By the way, let me just tell you, if you want to know how great a pastor is, just Google what's wrong with. <laughs> What's wrong with TD Jakes? What? You will find pages. Because the higher you go, the more a target you become. And the more people you'll offend. You just say something in your sermon. And people across the world, TD Jakes is not even local. It's, somebody in Korea will become offended by you. It's just the way it is. So offense will happen in the family. Offense will happen in the family. But here's the thing. Because of that offense, and, and let me just tell you, people just have expectations of you as you grow as a leader. Somebody just has a better expectation. They expect you to act differently from how they, even they act. You're a pastor, you should have known better. You shouldn't hurt people. You do hurt people, yes, but you're a pastor. It's just the way people act. Huh? So guess what happens then? Because of those expectations, you're going to find that many times we naturally hurt one another. We hurt one another. But here's where it becomes dangerous. It's when you allow that hurt, which is natural, to be taken advantage of by the devil. Because what the devil does is he brings a spirit that comes alongside your pain and becomes a spirit of offense. And you start thinking it's your pain speaking. Actually, it's not this pain. It's, it's a demon. And there's a demon called the spirit of offense. And that's a crazy, dangerous demon. Matthew chapter 28, verse 24, verse 10. It says, And then many will be offended and will betray one another, and will hate one another. This is talking about the church in the last days. That people will be offended. And out of their offense, they will hate each other. And they will betray each other. A time is coming when people will betray and hate each other because of a sense of being offended. Offense opens the way for treachery, for betrayal. It's just the way the scripture says it. It's as plain as that. Because you're human, you cannot be in a relationship without offending. Are you hearing me? You cannot be in a great marriage without offending your spouse. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. In fact, if you've never offended your, your spouse, I want to tell you, you're not in a good relationship. By the way, I am serious. You know, sometimes people hear me and they think I'm just making a point. I remember one couple, we, Carol can tell you, we, 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 we had a great friend of ours who were a couple, married for 10 years, never offended each other. Like, they were annoying. Oh, sweetie, oh, they laughed at each other's jokes. The girl would open the door for her. They, and you look at them and like, how do they do it? Like, how is it that they never, that, is it that, that, like, you feel judged? Like, what's wrong with us? Why is it that we always argue? What, we're not, we don't see things eye to eye. Then guess what happened? One day, the family of um, one of them, actually, I think it was a man's family, something dramatic happened, something bad happened. Um, I can't even remember what happened in the family, but it was a crazy, you know those things like a parent dying? Something crazy happened. And I kid you not, within a month, they had separated. And within a few months, they were, they were divorced. So you know what happened, huh? Because they never ever offended. What, what happens when you don't offend in a marriage? It means you never ever get close. When somebody says something that's offensive, you, you take a step back, ignore it, then come back like nothing happened. You're actually ignoring the differences. So one day what happens, a big enough difference comes up that you can't deal. And because you have no foundation, you're dead. So we teach in Doha that conflict, healthy conflict is actually good for a marriage. Why? It's helping you to get to know each other. When I conflict with Pastor Carol and we have a disagreement, God is giving us an opportunity to say, for me to say, my goodness, I was proud there. It was me. You know, he's giving me an opportunity to learn about myself. He's also giving me an opportunity to say, look, I can't be right all the time. I, maybe I was too harsh. He's giving us an opportunity. And then he's also helping me understand your wife is not you. Yeah. She thinks differently. If the two of you are thinking the same, one of you would be unnecessary. Yeah. 
So there's a, there's a contribution she's bringing in the marriage. It's true. There's a contribution in the marriage she's bringing. And when you understand that about your spouse, you stop being threatened by the difference. Yeah, yeah. You know, too many couples get threatened because my wife thinks differently from me. I'm the investor. I'm a risk taker. She doesn't like risk. So you just feel she's slowing me down. You don't understand that God brought her in your life because left to yourself, you will burn all that money and die destitute and poor. Your wife is God's way of putting brakes and helping you get sense and wisdom. I can see a wife right now just saying, thank you, pastor, just say it, say it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So, so the differences are not necessarily a bad thing. There's something you can lean into and help you grow. But here's the thing. You can allow those differences, those things to become an offense. And some people have a spirit of offense in their marriage. That means that whatever your spouse does, you filter it through that offense. She says something and you hear it from what happened several years ago. And you never can overcome that spirit of offense. There's something he did, he slipped up, he messed up, you've never forgiven him. It's become a spiritual thing. And let me tell you, your marriage is hanging on by a tenterhook, but it will break up because that spirit will not allow you to heal. And it's happening in the church as well. There are some people who walk around proudly proclaiming their church wounds. Like they just carry wounds on themselves, church wounds. Like I was hurt by this pastor. I was hurt by that church. I don't trust church anymore. It's become a fashionable thing to say that. And I'm not saying that you can't be hurt. I'm not trying to say that the church is perfect. In fact, the church is not perfect. In fact, if you ever come into church that is perfect, the minute you entered it, it stopped being perfect. Because you brought your issues into it, and you're not perfect. So, so what we're trying to say is there's no perfect church. But listen, when you allow that offense, as opposed to overcoming the offense, as opposed to saying the, past, the reason they hurt me is because they're not like me. They think differently. They're also a fallen person, but so am I. So I can forgive because God forgives my own imperfection. The minute you're not able to overcome that, then offense becomes your badge, and it becomes a spirit that divides you and cuts you from the family. So, so I just want to speak right now to somebody who you're carrying a spirit of offense because of something your father said to you or your mother said to you, your sibling said to you that has cut you off from your family. Or maybe it happened to you with, with uh, your spouse and something they did. It was un the unforgivable sin for you. And you're there, but you're not there. You've now put an escape route in your marriage. You're not even there because you've never ever been able to overcome that offense. And what I want to tell you is that is a spirit. And there's only one thing to do with a spirit. You tell it, get thee behind me. You bind it and you cast it out of your house. You know, I pray for people sometimes in a situation like that. And God taught my wife and she taught me this, that sometimes those are real things. It's not a feeling. It's actually real attacks. They are wounds by the enemy. And so what she taught us to do is to remove those uh, burning darts. We pull them out in prayer. And so physically, sometimes I'll do that. I just say, I'm pulling out the darts of the enemy right now from my spirit. I'm pulling out the darts of the enemy from your spirit. I'm speaking the balm of Gilead. And sometimes just from that prayer, somebody just says, my goodness, it's gone. I feel lighter. That's how the Lord works. So don't allow the spirit of offense to destroy you and cut you off from the family. You know, it's so funny. I was telling my exec team this last week in our meeting. I landed from Kampala. We had a fantastic time. My goodness, that was like my highlight of the year. Pastor Kilonzi, it was amazing. Like we showed up at the, the airport and you're like, there's nothing this year can do that can beat that. It's like it was so good. And so I reached home and it was night and we got a bit delayed in the airport. So I reached home at 11 o'clock and I walk into the house and it's, first of all, I call from the airport. I'm like, hey, sweetie, I've landed. And I'm like, uh, hello. I'm like, she's asleep. I said, okay, she must be asleep because she's trying to get a nap before I come, so she's ready for. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I check, I check into the house at 11. It's dark. The front door is open, so I push it. I'm like, ah, okay, she must be taking, she must have just put off the lights to create an ambience. <laughs> So, 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 so here I am, I walk into the bedroom, she is dead asleep. Now, now, let me just say this, like, we've been married for 27 years, going 28, it's never happened. Like, my wife waits for me, and I've never asked her to wait, by the way, in fact, I've never expected it, at least until I realized I expect it. You know, you get something and you take it for granted until it's not there, then you're like, how is it not there? So I remember, I was like, what? 
So I, 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 she, she was like, oh, I, so I, <laughs> I brushed my teeth, I entered bed. You know how you sleep? You can even fall off the bed. You're on your side. <laughs> like even if a colleague comes like this, you're like. <laughs> so the next morning we woke up and it's a morning. Usually when I come from a trip, we stay up in bed, we talk, we catch up, I give her my stories. I got up, my feet hit, hit the ground, pop, and I went to the bathroom and I was brushing my teeth. I'm sure she was like, eh? By the time she came out of bed, I was already dressed, and I was like, okay, so you're good, eh? I'm going for breakfast. So, <laughs> wait, wait, get your wife. I hope you're not single. <laughs> so so here's, here's, here's what happened. So I got downstairs, and she comes down, and she's like, so how was the trip? And I'm like, it was nice, it was good. Because in my spirit, I'm like, we need to discuss last night. <laughs> like, how do you sleep? So, so I was so pissed. I mean, it was so, and the, the whole morning, by the way, I must, I'm ashamed to say, the whole morning went with me pissed, you know, because I'm like, I'm waiting for you to explain yourself. <laughs> so, so fortunately, because I know Jesus, at some point I was like, hey, this offense is a bit deep. So I, I took a small walk and I just prayed, and I just felt the Lord saying, hey, seriously, you cannot come from a trip away and then come and cause an enmity with your wife. So I went and just apologized. I told her, hey, I was really pissed yesterday. What happened? Why didn't you wait? And then the poor woman started telling me how she had had, like she had had some three major, two major counseling sessions that were so draining spiritually. And I, know them, I knew the situations. Like they were crazy. I mean, one of them was a person who, was, who had been fired, who was just crying. The other one was somebody whose husband has cheated on them and was just crying. And she had carried that. She had been tired. It was her day off. She had to carry all this the whole afternoon. So she said, I just blacked out. I'm so sorry. By the way, I was crying. I was like, Oi. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you see what, what the devil does? Yeah. Like, if I, if I hadn't humbled myself to go and say I'm sorry and asked, yes. I would have gone through the next day and the next day, and, and something, I'm just waiting to blow up. Yes. I, I'm looking for an excuse to just get annoyed and say she didn't care about me. But that's not the truth. That's what the spirit of offense does to people. And so I want to say some of you have been carrying a spirit of offense. It's time to let it down. Yeah. That's the devil. And it's time for you to recognize, yes, recognize the voice of the Lord, but also recognize the voice of the enemy. Yes. Because he speaks to you and you start thinking it's your own voice. Yes. And it is a lie from, from the pit of hell. So the, the spirit of offense will cut you off from family. How many of you have seen the spirit of offense in your families? I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen people hurt and carrying that hurt. We've had family, like I never thought our family could have family feuds. Not my immediate family, but extended family. And just seeing somebody did something, that they, no, somebody imagined somebody did something. Yeah. And they determined in their mind that that somebody did something. Yeah. And that thing became a fact, a reality. They, are, yeah. they stopped talking to each other. The wives stopped talking to each other. The children stopped talking to each other. They were living next to each other and nobody for three years talked to the other. Yeah. Because of a spirit of offense. of offense. Ultimately, the guy discovered the guy never did any of what he thought. It was all fiction. So, a spirit of offense will cut you off from your family. King David's son, Absalom, was offended when his sister Tamar was raped by his half-brother Ammon. But his offense became a spirit of offense when he saw his dad be doing nothing. And he was so offended by his father, so offended by his brother, that it festered. And in three years, he killed his own brother. In cold blood, he killed him. And then after that, it continued festering. By the way, the death never avenged, because that spirit is not avenged. Revenge doesn't quench the spirit of offense. So he, 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 he killed the brother, and he still was offended. And it went to the place where he did a coup against his own father and slept with his father's concubines. Are you seeing how ugly that spirit is? In the sight of all Israel. I mean, that is just killing the family. Imagine how the family was after that. It's like nobody trusts anybody else. It just destroy, it's a family-destroying spirit. And there are many people out there working with church wounds, some with Mavuno wounds, many with Mavuno wounds, and my heart bleeds for them. Guys, I'm so sorry that there are people who would have to walk around with a wound caused by a church I lead. Yeah. That 20-year-old naive person who said, surely just love Jesus. I'm like, how is it that I can actually lead a church that has hurt people? I, I, it grieves my heart, I'll be honest. And I think the thing I want to say is, I never sit down in my living room and plan to hurt people. I never sit, as a father, I never sit and plan to hurt my children. It happens because we are human. 
And I think for me, my prayer would be if there's somebody in this room and that's you, that you would just see it in your heart to forgive. Because you too will be a father as well. And you will desire your children's forgiveness. So see it in your heart to forgive. But also don't let the devil cut you off from your destiny because of a spirit of offense. Wow. Uh, this one, by the way, for those of you who've been around Mavuno the longest, you're the ones most vulnerable with this one. Um, and uh, my goodness, I mean, I've, I've talked to people who just have bile against Mavuno. Bile. Pastor M, you're just a bad man. And I'm like, no, by the way, I know I'm a sinner, but I'm not a, I'm not a bad man. <laughs> Honestly, I never sit in my house and think of how to has, har- harass you and frustrate you. So how do we let go of that? Because if you don't, the devil cuts you off from family and cuts you off from destiny. Spirit of offense, that's a crazy spirit. We need to break the spirit of offense today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Number three, orphan spirit. Orphan spirit. We've defined this. We've been talking about this a lot, so I won't go into it too much uh, in, the, in the family night. But it's a demonic spirit that invades a person's mind, causing them to experience a sense of abandonment, rejection, separation, and independence. Uh, there's a way that the orphan spirit makes you feel like you're not wanted, makes you feel like you better reject before you're rejected, makes you feel like you really don't belong anywhere, um, that there's something better come. And by the way, people with an orphan spirit, they're always, one, one, one leg is in and one leg is always looking for the next place to go. They're always thinking, okay, I don't know how long I'm, I'm wanted here, so I better be ready to leave. But also, they're also looking for the place of, I'm not sure that this is the best place for me. I've met people like that. I've met people who've been married knowing that the marriage will break up. Yeah. Because it's so entrenched in their family, that orphan spirit, that you married knowing that this man will cheat on you. And it's like you were waiting. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. And when it happened, you said, I knew it. You had no reason, you had no reason to even suspect that you were part of the cause that it happened. Because it, you came in determined. You, you were sure you'd be let down. And of course, it becomes, wherever you go into a church and you have that spirit, you're sure people will let you down. And they do. It's called a self-fulfilling prophecy. What you expect will happen. If I come to you and I believe you're going to let me down, you will let me down. Because I'm not going to let you go until you do what, you, what I know you're supposed to do. So I'm going to push you until you let me down. This is just what happens. And this thing is, it's such a crazy thing. You know, the two, we talked about the two sons who, had, who were prodigals and both had an orphan spirit. Um, it, it's hard to see it, but actually it's, it operates in many, many Christians' lives. So now I want to say this. As I talked about the orphan spirit at Family Night, I realized that some of you actually are in the biological world, that you're actually orphans, that your parents passed on. And I just thought, my goodness, I hope in speaking about this spirit, I'm not bringing up wounds. That's not my intention. I'm really sorry if this brings up bad memories for you. That's not why I teach about the orphan spirit. In the biological world, there's nothing you can do to control that isn't it? Uh, your parents passed, they passed. That's just the way it is. Um, in the spiritual world, however, it is not God's intention for you not to be an orphan. There's nobody in the kingdom of God who is meant to be an orphan. God will put fathers and mothers into your life. So you need to be the one to plug in and to determine, I will not be an orphan in the church. I will not be an orphan spiritually. I will walk with parents. I will step on the shoulders of others to achieve great things. Uh, the, the, that orphan spirit will cut you off and make you take a long time, 40 years wandering in the wilderness to achieve the dream that God has for you. But having, there's something powerful about having a spiritual parent. Parents are powerful. They open doors. They do. I mean, right now we are coming here today and my wife was receiving a call from a good friend of hers who's actually here who was saying this something, there's an internship I'm looking for because your daughter, I think it would work so well for your daughter. I mean, like, my daughter has no clue that her parents and her parents' best friend are discussing and planning for her. That those are doors being opened. Parents open doors. If she didn't have those parents to do that for her, she, where would she be? And so what we're saying is God provides people so that you don't have to be an orphan. God provides people to accelerate you to the destiny that you are created for. And none of us should allow ourselves to be cut off. This is my prayer for us uh, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 to 6. He says, see, I will send the prophet Elijah. This is Malachi. I'll send the prophet Elijah to you before the great, that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. My prayer, I've been taking this as a promise for Mavuno in this season. 
I've been praying, by the way, that all of us who are estranged from our parents will become reconciled. Amen. And that every one of us in this family would have great, great relationships with their family of origin. Amen. That's my prayer. Some of you, by the way, your families are broken, messed up. Trust me, nothing is too difficult for the Lord. Amen. And the Lord is able to bring your heart and connect it to that mother-in-law. God is able to bring your heart and connect it to that father who cut you off. That's how he is. And even you, he's able to bring your heart around. Because some of you, you're so hard, you, you have a spirit of offense that will keep you from even wondering, surely, can I even want that? But God is able to bring that because there's nothing better than families that are united. And so I'm trusting God in this coming year, by the way, there will be a lot of testimonies of family unity. Uh, the orphan spirit is banished in this church in Jesus' name. Uh, there will be no space for it among God's people. Uh, and, and I also want to pray that spiritually, none of us will be an orphan. Amen. None of us will be an orphan. Uh, Psalm 92, verse 12 to 15, it says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. Come on, somebody. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this scripture a little later, but I think it's such a powerful scripture for us, that God plants us in the house of the Lord. He gives us spiritual parents in that house. And what happens when you do that? They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in their old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright, He's my rock, and there's no wickedness in Him. So when you have an orphan spirit, you don't benefit from being where God has placed you. But when you have a spirit of adoption, a spirit of sonship, boom, inheritance flows. Boom, blessings flow. Boom, all those things that were cut out from you, they flow down your, your family line. I believe that this church has a great inheritance for every one of us. This is, this is a house that God has called us to. There's a great vision here that is big enough for all of us. There are great attributes. That, by the way, every church is a family, and every church has blessings. If you belong to Sitam, Sitam has great blessings. If you belong to Parklands Baptist, Parklands Baptist has great blessings. If you belong to Worship Harvest, Worship Harvest has a great anointing and blessing. If you belong to Mavuno, there are unique blessings in this house. There are blessings in this house. And those blessings are distinct from any other church, by the way. It's because they are the blessings of this house. And we call them out many times with Pastor Caro because we believe God has given this church those blessings. I've mentioned them before. Say them again. Amen. <laughs> Pastor Caro, what are our blessings? Let me see. If... We have blessing of a good marriage. That's a blessing of this house. It is. I don't care where you came from, whether there were bad marriages where you came from, but the anointing in this house is that God desires that everyone here will have a good marriage. It's his blessing. And not a marriage that you have to posture and, 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 and you, will you will be friends in your marriage. I really believe that's what God has, desires for every couple in this church. And it is really the inheritance of this church. Good parenting. Yeah. God, God's blessing in this house is good parents. You will flourish with your children. I believe that my children will be great leaders, by the way. Amen. Mine, mine, they will be great leaders. And I believe your children will be great leaders as well. Amen. This is who we are as a family. You're going to enjoy that. We have the blessing of wealth that has no sorrow. Amen. That's a blessing of this house. And let me tell you guys, it is true. We have experienced wealth without sorrow. Yes. It's just the blessing of the Lord. My pastors can tell you. They don't see me hustling. Yeah. They don't see me dying. But they see wealth in my house. Yes. And they also know I'm not a thief. <laughs> and that this church doesn't pay me. They know all those things. So in fact, sometimes they ask, Pastor, how is it that you're building a house and you're, we're not paying you a salary and it's COVID? How? They ask me those hard questions. But they can see, I don't neglect my children. I don't neglect my spouse. I'm not hustling. I'm seeking the kingdom of God and other things are being added. That is a blessing of this house. It's a blessing of this house, guys. So what we're saying is there's an anointing that is distinct and is useful and will help you achieve your... There's a global anointing in this house, by the way. There's a global anointing that you will impact nations. Amen. By the way, it's just the thing. You know how families just have a thing that in our family, in our family, we impact the globe. So even for you who's just at home looking after children, you're, you're raising world changers right now. Yeah, you're not raising mediocre people. It's just the blessing of this house. So, so the orphan spirit cuts you off from blessing. Amen. So we don't want the orphan spirit. It's one of the ones that you just cut off and say, we don't want the orphan spirit. John 8, 5, Jesus said to his disciples, now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs forever. Hmm. Tell your neighbor, you belong. You belong. You belong. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
All right, I'm going to go to the fourth one. And let me give you permission, by the way. It's getting nice and warm. It's just that siesta time. So if you feel like standing and just going to stand on the side, uh, you look very spiritual and I won't get offended. <laughs> Don't fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, just... That's, you know, Paul, Paul taught, I won't take it personally because Paul, the apostle Paul taught and a guy fell asleep. Yeah. In fact, the guy fell asleep and even fell to his death. That's how asleep the guy was. So if you fall asleep, just, just stand so that you don't have to. Uh, yeah, it's okay. I will not even look. Number four, a critical spirit. Some of us are gifted with the personality and spiritual gift that allows us to see everything that can and will go wrong with anything that is proposed. It's like an idea is shared and instantly you can tell the 15 ways this thing can go south. You're laughing because you know yourselves or you know your spouse. It's like you can easily see this idea can hurt so many people. You, you get it and already you can tell all things that can go wrong with that idea. And it's truly a gift, by the way. <laughs> it's a gift. You have a gift of foresight. I praise God for that. But you must be careful not to get into the space where you use it to notice and magnify the faults of everyone around you. A critical spirit is a dangerous thing. It can derail. It can derail. Because you see all that is wrong and you don't see all that could go right as well. And that's a dangerous spirit. So, so again, what happens is there's a personality. I am melancholic. And that allows me to, to be very analytical. Praise God for males. Yeah, we need you. We need you. Yeah, absolutely. You are analytical. You see things. You have clarity. You, you, folk, you have an inner life. Yes. You don't have to actually talk about it. You take it and you reflect on it. Yes. And when you reflect, you can say it and you've thought through everything ahead. Woo. Many steps ahead. Yeah. And you can be extremely frustrating for your spouse. Amen. Amen. Yeah, because anything they propose, you're already telling them how it's going to go wrong. How it's not going to work. Like, why were they even thinking what you're thinking? And your personality can, if, and, and let me just say, the male personality is not a bad person. There's no personality that's a bad personality. I believe it's a God-given strength for the church of God. But when you allow the critical spirit to become a dominant spirit in your life, then what happens is you become a terror down and not a builder up. People with a male personality, people with a prophetic gift, prophets also are like that. Huh? Some of you have a very strong prophetic gift. And so you're the, you, you clearly can see in prophets, by the way, can be... In fact, that's why Jeremiah was called the, the, the weeping prophet. It's like you see some... Uh, it's like you already can see how things are just going to be thick for these people, you know. You can become so depressing to be around. When you have a critical spirit, you must be careful. We have, daughter, we, we have children who are male. And one of the things that we do is we disciple them. And we've had to disciple them and say, when you wake up, the world will be okay. So wake up with a good, good spirit. When I ask you, how was your night? Say, it was amazing. Don't, you're learning. Amen. <laughs> Don't say, it was okay. I'm like, oh, what do you mean it was okay? You're alive. <laughs> like, it was, a, you slept. Surely, that's a good night. What are you expecting? <laughs> like, like so you slept and you woke up. What? <laughs> it was okay. <laughs> so so we, we disciple our children to be positive. When somebody says something about you, say, oh, thank you. Don't say, okay. Because you already have analyzed their motives, what they could be thinking, why they said, why did they? <laughs> what do you really want? So a person with a critical spirit finds faults with the way the worship team did the music, the way the preacher preached the sermon, the announcements were made, the way the pastor was dressed, the, the, the way he walked, the words he said, your, your, oh, the lights, the way they were working, it's, you're sorry. It's like, it's like you find fault easily. You find that it's a very natural thing for you to find. Now, here's the thing. Leaders with a critical spirit in the Bible. Numbers 12, 12 verse 1. It says, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Verse 2. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? They asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? It's like, seriously, that pastor, why is he preaching? Can he even ask we don't read the Bible? We don't hear God ourselves? They asked, and, and the Lord, and the Bible said, and the Lord heard this. Now, verse 3, now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. So, in other words, on the ground, things were different. They were so critical 
that they missed out the fact that the guy who was leading them was the most humble national leader in the whole planet. Because here's what happens when you have a critical spirit. You see only what is wrong. You never see what is right. So you criticize your wife so badly and you don't understand that God has given you such an amazing gift. Such an amazing gift. You miss out on that fact that somebody else given the same wife would produce an amazing angel out of her. And you're looking around at other people's wives and thinking, why can't she be like that? It's true. You know, they say when the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, water your own grass. Yeah. It's because you're not watering. So you've criticized her until she never even looks up. She just looks down because you're so perfectionist. You've criticized that man until he can't make a decision without shaking. He can't even tell you what he's doing because you know, he knows your first response will be to tell him what won't work. That's a critical spirit. It's, it's moved away from personality and it's become a spiritual issue. And the thing about it is, Absalom also found faults with his father David. Remember the spirit of offense? Led him to a spirit of criticism. And if you read in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3, he, he used to sit outside the gate of the city, timing the people who are coming to see the king for judgment. And then listen to what he'd tell them. He'd say, look, your claims are valid and proper. <laughs> like, Yanni, you're so on point. Maze, the things you're saying are so deep. I'm so feeling you, man. And then he'd say, but there's no representative for the king to hear you. And this guy has not even, he doesn't even have plans for hearing people like you with real issues. And Absalom would add, if only I was appointed a judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or cause could come to me and I would see that they receive justice. Sheesh. Like, he is talking about his own father. And he is just cutting him down. There's a quote by Doug Hayward Mills that's where he says, your point of view depends on your viewpoint. From where you're looking, if you have a negative viewpoint, everything that happens, your point of view will always be negative. If you think somebody is a mess and you don't trust them and they're bad, and they're, everything they do will always fit into that prism. So your point of view will always depend on your viewpoint. Where you're looking at the person from will determine what you see. You've heard that little story about two people, one, uh, a guy who went into a town and then he met some people in the town and asked them, what kind of town is this? And they told him, this is a town when people are horrible, People cut each other down. It's a terrible place to live. Have, have you heard that story? And he, he I mean, it was, it was so depressing what they told him about the town. And indeed, everybody, when he entered the town, everybody he found was like that. He goes to another town and asks them what kind of people. They say, people here love each other. They're amazing. And guess what happens? When he enters the town, he expects that. And that's what he finds. That's how we are as human beings. What we expect is what we find. When we moved into Pine City, uh, where Pastor James lives with Pastor Carol, because it was a new estate, we would take a gift and visit people. And we'd not, when, when new people came into the estate, we'd take a gift, we'd visit, and we'd knock on the door. And when they came out, they'd be like, you know, they came from Nairobi, they're moving here. First of all, they're, they're looking at you through the car. Like, who are these guys? Like, nobody knocks on doors in Nairobi. And then we'd come with cake. In fact, we'd even put our kids in front of us so they can see we mean no harm. And then would, the kids would be cutting cake and maybe some pilau and would, would tell them, oh, we are your neighbors. The reason we came is because we wanted to welcome you to the estate. We would say, everybody in this estate loves each other. It's a lovely place to live. People welcome each other in this place. And so we're just here doing it. And the person, in fact, I remember one lady cried. Like she broke down and cried. You know, moving is hard. And she just cried. Like she hadn't even thought of supper for her kids. We brought her the food. The next time we're going to see another neighbor and we knock, and actually, before we reach, we find the family that we had told it's a good place were there before us. And they knocked, and they brought food, and then they told the person, people in this estate love each other. It's a good place to live, and they visit each other. So when we arrived, the person said, Allah, even you guys, this whole estate is a lovely place. Guess what happened? People started to do that for each other. Because your viewpoint determines your point of view. When you expect people to be good, guess what? they'll be good. When you expect people to be useless, they'll be useless. So this is the thing. Miriam and Aaron, it didn't, it's not about the leader. It's about themselves. If you find yourself with a critical spirit, it's about you. And this criticism in both sides, in both families, it led to major harm. In the case of Miriam, it led to leprosy and major, major issues there. In the case of, uh, of Absalom, it led to death. A critical spirit can actually lead to death. And I'm going to go to the last one then which is, and remember, we're talking about the things that destroy families, huh? 
we've talked about the fact that God is calling us to be a family. But now I'm sharing with you the things that will actually stand in the way of families. As you're building your families, as you're leading people, some of you are going to be discipling people in your offices. And I praise God for that. God is going to give you opportunity to, 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 to build spiritual sons and daughters in that corporate place he's placed you in. And you're going to raise up some kingdom giants around you. These are the things you want to watch out for as a spiritual parent. The spirit of strife. The spirit of strife. Now, this is a very dangerous spirit in families and churches. There are people who are not only critical, it's people who are not just critics, but they work hard at rallying other people around them so that they have an army of critics behind them. Wow. That is a person with a spirit of strife. They're never happy unless they've gathered a following around them of other disaffected people. And that's what Absalom was doing. He tells us in the next passage there, 2 Samuel 15, 6, Absalom behaved in this way towards all the Israelites who came to see the king asking for justice, and so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. Amen. Absalom didn't just have a critical spirit, he had a spirit of strife. And that spirit was leading from offense to critical to strife. And now he was, trying to, he was leading an insurrection. Yes, he hadn't done a coup yet, but in his heart the coup had already happened. He was out to overthrow his father. He was stealing the hearts of Israel. People with a spirit of strife will stop at nothing short of splitting the family or the church. And there are people like that, by the way. Some of you know people like that. They break family. They are family breakers. They are home breakers. They send out feelers to see who else around them is feeling the same way. They're always looking for people. And they'll ask questions like, hey, have you noticed so many people are leaving our church? Hey, what's happening? Since Pastor Kilonzi came, I'm just seeing people are just leaving. Huh? He's fishing. He's fishing. He's looking for other people who are like, yeah, even me, I was worried. About, uh huh. Now we are in the family. Come, enter line here. Join the line. Let's look for others like ourselves. He asks things like, don't you feel the, the pastor summons nowadays are not as powerful as they used to be? I just feel like there's no anointing in this church. They'll say things like those. Or why, why are these people always talking about numbers? Like, Mavuno, they just seem to care about reaching people and numbers. Why? And someone's like, yeah, even me, I was wondering, eh? Don't they care about us? That person is fishing. They're looking. They want to involve you. They want to get you into their space. And people like this, they want to become the spokesman, official spokesman for the opposition. That's their title. That's a title that makes them happy. And you'll hear them say, by the way, they'll actually become this person. I've heard this before. They, they, they come and talk to you and then they say, but they, a lot of people are saying this. Yeah, yeah. They are saying, many people are so concerned nowadays in this church about so and so. Many people, they'll always, they'll always throw out names like those. Whenever, by the way, somebody comes and tells me many people are, I'm always like, you are talking for yourself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because if you are saying, first of all, the question I'd ask you is, why did those many people locate you? Why did they know that you're the person to talk to and not me? They must have seen, sensed something in you that just attracted them so they could bring all their criticism to you. So there must be something about you. There's something that's drawing those people to yourself. And then secondly, you're probably using their complaints as you're, 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 you're shielding yourself behind them. And so this thing is, is, is a very dangerous thing. In fact, I call this one the most dangerous. I call it the Lucifer spirit. This is a Lucifer spirit. Because think about Lucifer. That's exactly what he did. Created by God, the most powerful of the angels. I mean, I, I think they were, they were, he's like one of the archangels. Archangels, by the way, are not just ordinary angels. In the Bible, ordinary angels, you see them, you fall like a stone to the ground in terror. Archangels are a, a whole different ballgame. They are principalities. They rule territories. They are powerful beings. So he's created as one of the most powerful of the powerful beings. Um, and some, some theologians say that there are three archangels in charge of all the millions of angels. I don't know how true that is or where they read that. But they actually are saying that what they're, the point they're making is that these are among the top tier it's like the cabinet, the ones who sit around God. If you read Ezekiel describing the ones around God, they're not just normal things. He talks about in his human mind what he could see, which I don't even think it was the case. It's just what his mind could comprehend. He says they have the face of a lion and the face of an ox and the face of a man and the face of a... It's like, what is that? And then the thing has to do wings, uh, four wings, uh, wings on the top and wings... And the wings all have eyes all over. It's like, what are you describing, Ezekiel? Are you mad? But I think his mind just goes crazy because these things are such powerful beings and wheels behind them and the wheels have eyes. By the way, read that. I tried to read that thing. I was like, either this girl was high 
<laughs> or the thing he saw was so crazy, he couldn't even describe it in human language. Huh? So Lucifer is one of those guys. And the Bible says he's, he's, he's like the son of the morning. He's so beautiful. He leads the heavenly choirs. But guess what he does? At some point, he begins to think, why can't I also have a, a stake in this? Why is it only God who shares? Yeah, many angels are saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people are concerned about the decisions you're making. Some people, some theologians think that the decision that really drove him away was a decision to, uh, to promote humanity. Because the Bible says that angels are ministering spirits. So these powerful beings, God says, I have a plan, guys. I have a plan. I'm going to take mud and I'll put spirit in it. And then I'll make it so powerful it'll become my child. And then you guys will help it. Wait, 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 wait. We were here first. We become ministering spirits to those ones. We are more powerful than them. And then you want us to serve. That's what some people think. I, I, it's not in the Bible again. I say it's speculation. But for whatever reason, Lucifer compromises a third of the angels in heaven. And they become the demons that are cast down with him. So, so this is a Lucifer spirit. And a person with this spirit is extremely dangerous to the unity of the family. You need to catch it quickly and deal with it. People like that carry away passive members. Let me just say, there's no such thing as a neutral, there's neutral ground. I'm just an innocent bystander in Mavuno. You're just waiting to be swept away by the Lucifer spirit. Because there's that guy who just come like, boom. He's just looking to recruit innocent bystanders. People who have no stand of their own. People who don't know why they're here, they're just leaders, but they don't understand what they're leaning into. They're not part of it, they're not plugged in. And that person is looking for those loose ones so he can confuse them. That's why there's no neutral space. Uh, it's very interesting because that's what happened to Aaron. In Numbers 12, when it talks about Miriam and Aaron speaking against uh, Moses, it's very interesting. You ask the question, why is it that Miriam gets leprosy and Aaron doesn't? I suspect Aaron was just minding his business. And then Miriam asked him, people are saying, and he's like, yeah, by the way. <laughs> Next thing you know, he's part of it. He's joined a, a, a rebellion he had nothing to do with. And in this case, God is very merciful because he, he, Miriam is, is cast to leprosy, but she, Moses prays for her and she's healed, and Aaron, nothing happens to him. The innocent bystander is spared. But that's not always the case in Scripture. There's another family rebellion like that. Moses had relatives uh, who are the sons of Levi because he was a son of Levi. And one of them was called Korah. And Korah decided to rally up some guys who are not even in the family, some outsiders who are Reubenites. And they were called Dathan and Abiram. And they started talking to people and saying, are you guys seeing what we are seeing? Yeah, that guy, who does he think? And soon they had 250. These were dangerous, dangerous people in the house. They gathered a family of 250 people. And the Bible says in Numbers 16, verse 1 to 3, Korah, son of Iza, the son of Kohath, son of Levi, and certain Reubenites, Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab and On, son of Peleth, became insolent and rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israel men, well-known community leaders. Are you understanding? These are not just regular people. Who had been appointed members of the council. Who had appointed them? Moses! So they had been appointed by somebody else. They came up as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and say to them, you've gone too far. The whole community is holy. Every one of them and the Lord is with them. Why do you set yourself up against the Lord's assembly? Like we're speaking for the people, guys. People are saying. People are unhappy. People are not feeling this direction. Now, in the case of Korah, and the point I want to make with this, in this case, the innocent bystanders are not so lucky. Because the Bible says that Korah, Dathan, and Abiram are swallowed up by the earth. I mean, that, that's a horrible death. Huh? Like their tents, their children, their wives, everything. Just, the earth just... Like, like, where did they go? I have no clue. It just sounds horrible. But the Bible says the other 250 men, with their because they had all come with their in incense sensors to prove that they were greater than Aaron. All of them, the fire came from heaven and destroyed all of them. And all that was left was those censers. Like they were just burnt to a toast. Even their clothes, nothing was left except the things they were holding. And the reason those were not burnt is because they were holy. They were using the temple censers. Like everything destroyed. Let me tell you, being an innocent bystander is not a very wise thing. 
It's not a wise thing. Don't be that person who people look for to say, by the way, have you noticed in our church? Have you heard? Have you noticed what's happening? Don't be that person because you get carried away. I believe God's word to each of us is you must become a family builder. You must become a family builder. Tell your neighbor, you must become a family builder. Yeah. You can't be in the family and not be a builder. You can't be in the family and be an innocent bystander. You must be an active builder of your family. If you want to thrive, if you want to go places in life, you must be building your family. Your family is your foundation. It's a thing that will prop you up. And I'm talking about church, but I'm also talking about your physical family. You must be a family builder. You can't be a neutral observer of your family, not as God, not as a fearless influencer. You must be in that space. Uh, I, I read that psalm before, Psalm 92, verse 12 to 14. It says, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age, shall be fresh and flourishing. That's my prayer for all of you. Yeah. By the way, let me tell you what. When you're planted, this is what begins to happen. There's a principle here. It says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord. Ask your neighbor, are you planted? Yeah, this, is, this thing is for those who are planted. And it says that those who are planted, that you can actually be in God's house and not planted. There are people around us, innocent bystanders. They're around us and not planted. They're just coming to church. They're just visiting, but they're not really connected. They're even serving in a ministry, but their hearts are not planted. And it's saying that to be planted, in fact, I'd say this, what is to be planted is to be committed. It is to love. It is to be of one mind. It is to be here to stay. It's like a marriage where, you, where divorce is not an option. We're going to make this thing work. By the way, let me tell you a very simple secret that we are taught when we are dating. Somebody taught us this, and it has been a fantastic, fantastic secret. To make us last, we have a marriage till death do us part. And the reason we have that marriage is because that person told us divorce is not an option. Never, ever raise it up. Never discuss it as an option. Never even think of it as a card that you can wave to the other person. It is out. You will resolve your issues without, it's not even an option. We are in this for life. And by the way, let me tell you, that thing was such a beautiful thing. Because it doesn't matter what kind of pain that we've caused each other. There's always that commitment of, we're going to work it out. I may not be feeling you right now. I may not want to see your face. I may not be very happy with you. But you know what? We're going to see this thing through. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here. I'm here. I was talking to a friend whose husband had an affair. And she was devastated. She was devastated. And she said, I don't, Pastor, I don't have a marriage. And I, I reminded her of her vows. I said, you said, till death. I said, let me tell you what. The enemy wants to cut you off from your marriage. He wants your children to grow up fatherless because he's in the business of orphanhood. When you say you don't have a marriage, why? I said, you are there. You said the vows. You said between yourself and him and God, there is a covenant. I told her, stand on the strength of that covenant. Pray for your husband's salvation. Pray that the devil will stop harassing him. Remember, there's only one enemy, and your, your husband is not it. There's an enemy who wins when your marriage is, is destroyed. And so I said to her, you stand and you lean in. You understand, yes, there's been pain, but God can heal the pain of offense. But you're here to stay. And you know, it was so interesting because she called me after a couple of days and said, Pastor, you know, he had moved, the guy had even moved out of the house because he was so embarrassed and ashamed. And she called me and she said, he called me. No, he, he, she said, I woke up in the morning and I was reflecting on what you said. I prayed. And so I sent her a message. And I said, I miss you. The children miss you. I hope you're well. We're praying for you. And she said, no, like the message landed and the guy called. Like he just picked up the phone and called. They hadn't talked since he walked out. And the guy said, how are you? And she said, I'm fine. She says, we're praying for you. We know you'll be well. We're praying for you. We pray for you every night with the kids. And he asked, how are the kids? And it was a, an emotional conversation. Now the man is still lost. He's not yet home. But I told her, that's your role. You stand on the fact that the devil is not going to take away your marriage while you're alive. Oh, come on. You have authority. Yes. You know, the devil comes like a roaring lion. That's what the Bible says. By the way, that's a hard word for people from my part of the country to say. Roaring lion. He comes like that. <laughs> you take it anyway. And what he does, and I was telling my team, what a lion does, because a lion never... Have you ever noticed lions don't roar while they are hunting? Have you ever noticed that? 
So how does the devil come roaring? And yet, he's hunting. I'll tell you why. Because the only lion that can roar when it's hunting is a lion that is weak and old and has no pride. That's it. Why? Because lions, when they have pride and strength and they have a team with them, they come quietly. They know they can take you down. But an old lion that has been abandoned by all the females, it's weak, it can't run too fast, it knows there's no way it's going to catch this antelope. It can't be quiet enough to jump on it. So what does it do? It uses its only asset. It comes as close as it can, and then, roar! have you ever had a lion roar, by the way? It is the most scary thing. Even if you know it theoretically, let me tell you, when you hear it, it is a paralyzing sound. Like, it's crazy. Like, I don't even think if you go on the on, uh, online and you press lion roar, you never, like, you have to experience it to, to know what this thing is. Huh? It is so loud. So when it releases the roar, guess what happens? Panic. The little antelope just becomes stuck. That thing comes in surround sound. You don't even know where the lion is. You start peeing on yourself. And at that point, the lion just walks up to you and takes you down. And I say to this woman, guess what happens? The devil knows he cannot take you down. So what has he done? He has roared loudly. And in his roar, you're panicking. You're saying, I don't think I have a marriage. I don't have strength anymore. I cannot fight for this thing. I'm weak. And guess what is happening? The lion is now coming to devour you. I said, listen, understand, that's a dead, it's a lion that has no hope. It is finished. That's why it roars. The Bible says resist the devil. Does he, what does he do? Flee. It's not like, you know, in the, the antelope, in real life, the antelope has the power to flee. For us, we don't flee from the lion. We tell it, where? Hands off my husband. That's what you tell it. And guess what? He has no choice. Am I speaking to somebody in the house today? Yes. Yeah, you fight. You fight for the family. You fight for the family. You don't let the family's offense kick you out because the devil wins. Yeah. And so you fight. You fight for the family. So this is, this is the, the principle that I believe that God wants us to learn. When I'm not planted, I'm on my way somewhere. When I'm not planted, I'm always looking for the next best thing. When I'm not planted, I'm always thinking this marriage might end any time. I need to protect myself. When I'm not planted, I'm always thinking what other church could I go to? Let me just keep my options open. Where else can I visit just to make sure if Mavuno just goes down, <laughs> I don't go down with it. That's how somebody who's not planted thinks. But when you're planted, you're not looking to see what other people are doing, so you respond to them. When you're planted, it's not about them, it's about you. You're not helping the other person, you're in this to win it. You're here for you. And you're going to make it work. This is what it is. This marriage will work because me and God are a majority. That's the thing. By the way, let me just say, you and God are a majority. My wife has nothing on me. Let me tell you this. She can tell you. There are things I have prayed for her. I've appealed to the courts of heaven. And she has come back and told me, Pastor, why are you praying for me? Because that thing that I was so dead stuck on, I'm not feeling it anymore. And I'm like, me and God are a majority. I don't need to appeal to you. Has, you cannot, by the way, you can do that to your husband. She does that to me all the time. That's why I can say that. There are times I know that she's just praying. I'm like, I don't change my mind. I'm adamant. She's praying. Ah, this woman, she's just praying. Ah, fine, let's just do it. Like, that's a power of prayer. You can actually win through prayer. You don't have to win through fighting in the family. Just win through prayer. So, so guys, this is what I'm saying. Like, let's not allow the devil to come and cut us off from your family. In this season, God is going to do some great things in life for he will. He will. And let me just tell you, life for people, God is going to use Pastor Godwin and Noel to lead a revival that will take a whole bunch of young people. Uh, change this world. Don't let, do not, do not, tell your neighbor, do not. Do not allow anything to stand in the way of you being part of what God is doing in your generation. Yeah, stick, stick closely. I believe God is going to do the same thing in Mavuno South. Yeah, in this season, God is going to do some powerful things in Mavuno South. Amen. Yeah, and they're going to be revival level things yeah. that God is going to use this couple to bring about. Yeah. Don't allow, don't allow the devil to come in and bring busyness and other things to cut you off from this source. There's a source of blessing for your generation. What God is doing in this generation, be part of it. Amen. Let's not allow these spirits to come in and break our families. Mashariq, you know already the revival is happening, huh? Yeah. It's happening, it's happening. In this season, don't allow anything, even sin, don't allow anything to stand in your way. Young people, you're strong. The yes. Bible says you're strong. Yes. <laughs> you will overcome the world. Yes. So, so receive from Papa Mills, yes. from, from, from Pastor Milton. Yes. Receive. He has blessing for you, Pastor Viv. They have something for you. 
Receive it. And follow hard in this season. Because I believe there's a virtue in that house. There's a virtue in Mashariki. Are you hearing me? There's an anointing in your church that is going to do some great things in this movement. I believe Lovington is no different. Let me tell you guys, God is going to do some great things in Lovington, in Mombasa, in Karen. God is, God is about to just break out in powerful ways. And so let me just say, stick tight. Stick tight. Some of you guys, my goodness, your, your life is going to be changed. Let me tell you, just by being near Pastor Oscar and being around the anointing of God in his life, I am who I am today. I was just that guy in campus with no idea my life was about to change. That I was about to become a global <laughs> leader because I was next to the right person at the right time. And I'm just saying, in this season, God is about to do some powerful things. My goodness, Hill City, you guys have no, no eye has seen. No eye has seen what God is about to do for you guys. Like, like I'm just telling you, the things that God is about to do, you guys, this tent is so small. This space is so small. And for all the associated campuses, God is about to do some major breakthrough stuff. I bless God for every one of you. So let's lean in. Amen. Tell your neighbor, lean in. Lean in. I want us to pray. I'm going to ask us to stand on our feet right now because I want us to pray. Wow, even the wind of the Spirit is flowing. Can you tell? The atmosphere is different. I want us to pray. And I want us to pray for ourselves. You have seen and spotted things that I've mentioned about. Some of you have been convicted about something in your life or in the life of your family. Amen. Some of you can see something that has been disturbing your family. There's been a spirit of strife in that family. There's been a spirit of independence, isolation, people just doing their thing. We never talk. Listen, the reason God gave you this message is because you are the one who is going to bring hope to that family. Let me say, I pray for all of you that you, you will become the source of hope for your families. Why should you be in Mavuno and your family has no hope? Yeah, No, never. And let me tell you something. Claim not just your children. Claim your siblings in Jesus' name. Claim them all for yourself. By the way, me, I'm such a, I'm an aggressive, I pray for my children, but I also pray for my, my siblings' children, Amen. that they will be like me. <laughs> I know, I'm like, but see, I'm a good person to follow. Why can't they be like me? I pray very militant prayers, even for my siblings. They're here, I pray for them very militant. I pray that, by the way, I pray all my siblings will follow God and serve Him. I pray that they'll all plant churches. By the way, that's my prayer. I, I'm, I'm, I'm now reporting myself. I pray very uncomfortable prayers for those I love. Because I'm like, what else, why, why would you not want your life to count for eternity and to do things that matter for the kingdom? So I pray those prayers for my family. And by the way, I don't believe any of my family members will be insignificant in Jesus' name. They're all going to do great things. And listen, because you're in that family, greatness is a portion of your father's family in Jesus' name. It is. Even those alcoholic siblings of yours, they will become pastors in Jesus' name. And they will preach the gospel across the world because you are there. You have to claim it for yourself. This, I believe, is what God wants for every one of us. So I want us to confess prayers of confession, confessing the independent spirit, confessing the spirit of offense, confessing the orphan spirit, confessing the critical spirit, the spirit of strife. And I just want to take a moment right now and just pray. pray raise up a prayer for yourself. Raise up a prayer of confession. Just say, Lord, forgive me for where I have seen this happening in my life. Forgive me, Lord. Come on, just lift up your voice. Just begin to speak to your Father. If you're watching on video, just, just begin to pray about the, the particular affliction, the particular place that you see a, a predilection, you see a, a, a leaning towards something that could actually be happening, a place where you've been tempted to go in that direction. And just begin to confess it to the Lord and say, Lord, I will have nothing to do with it. In fact, even begin to bind that spirit as you confess it. Bind it. Cast it out of your life. Say, spirit of, 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 of independence, that is not my portion. In Jesus' name, I bind you right now and I break. I cast you to the place Jesus prepared for you. I will not walk in independence anymore. Spirit of criticism, a critical spirit, orphan spirit, spirit of offense. I pull out. Somebody just begin to pull out those things from your spirit. Pull out those darts. Physically, just pull them out. Say, Lord, I remove this offense. The words that were spoken to me by my father, the words that my wife spoke to me that made my heart grow cold. I pull those things out right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I will not take offense as a spirit. Offense is a natural part of what human beings do to each other. I will not allow offense to become a spiritual force that will tear down my family. Come on, confess that spirit of strife. Some of you, you've seen your family destroyed by the spirit of strife. Confess it and your part in it. And begin to say, Lord, I will not be part of that spirit. I will be a family builder. 
I will be a family builder. That is my portion. That is what God wants for me. I, I choose that. For those of you in Mavuno Bujumbura, Mavuno Berlin, come on, just become a family builder. Just say it in prayer. I will be a family builder. I will build my physical family. I will build my spiritual family. Lord, this is my portion in Jesus' name. I will take it, Lord. Come on, begin to confess that you are planted. Just say, Lord, I choose to be planted in my family. I will not be that isolating factor. Uh, my family will not split on account of me. My husband will not be frustrated on account of me. Lord, I will be a follower. I choose to be planted, Lord. I will support this person. I will support the leaders in my life. They will have joy on account of me. My pastor will be glad that I'm part of this campus. Oh, Father, I bless you, Lord, for your people praying right now. Receive the prayers of your people, Lord. Heavenly Father, you're here. You love us. You hear us. Lord, the orphan spirit is being uprooted from this church in Jesus' name. We bless you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, people who've walked in orphanhood for years, that Lord, right now they're being reconnected to family. Lord, where there's been grief and darkness and sadness, that Lord Jesus, joy is coming in right now. Joy is coming in right now. Connection is coming in right now. That is our portion in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you're here, that God is for us. If the Lord is for us, who can be against us? Lord, you've told us you've given us authority over every demonic spirit. And so, Lord, we take that authority right now and we take charge of our destiny. Lord, we bind the enemy. We cast him out of our lives. We cast him out of our family's lives. Now begin to pray for your family. Pray for your father's family. Pray for your children. Where you've seen these spirits at, at work, pray against them. Where you've seen these spirits destroying or harming a particular member, pray for them. Pray that God would just open their eyes right now. Pray that the Father would allow them not to be harmed or harm the family. Father, we pray for our families. Lord, our families will prosper. Our families will be strong. Lord Jesus, they will not fall. There's no family here that will fall, Lord. Lord Jesus, on account of our being fearless influencers, on account of our being members of this family, Lord, we pray that we declare that our family will stand. Our family will have significance. Our siblings will be great. They will accomplish great things for the kingdom. This is our commitment. This is our prayer. This is our understanding. I pray for my siblings. They will do great things for God. Their children will be great. They will follow God. They will love Him. Our family will be known as people who love God. We will build churches. We will advance your kingdom. This is our family, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Father God, I'm planted in my family. I'm planted in my family. Come on, somebody just, you're planted in the family. Just declare it in the heavenlies right now. The enemy will hear your voice. I'm planted in this family. Lord, I choose to be planted. I will not be a skeptic. I will not be a cynic. I will not hide on the, on the outskirts. I will not wait for others to step up. I will step up. I will take responsibility because I am planted. I'm planted in the house of my God. I bless you, Lord, that I will flourish in this house. I will flourish in this house. This is my portion, Lord. This is my portion. I bless you, Jesus. I bless you, Jesus. You are such a good God. You're such a faithful God. You're such a faithful God. I want to speak to a parent here who's been isolated from your children. Your children have operated with a spirit of orphanhood. But I'm speaking over you right now and the word that God has for you is that God will plant their hearts and yours together. God will connect them with your heart. You've been praying about this for a while and the Lord is saying it is done in Jesus name. It is done. Your children will love you and they will make you proud. I don't know who I'm speaking to, but there's just somebody right now, you've been crying out to God, you've been really crying out to God for your children. And God is saying that family is, it will be intact in Jesus name. Amen. And your children will make you proud. They'll make you proud. They're yours, I gave them to you. <laughs> you didn't give them to yourself. They will make you proud. Hey, come on, if this is your word, receive it. Receive it. I just sense that somebody, the Lord needs you to know that, that he's given you these children. And you've been in despair and in pain, but it's the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. He will plant them in your house. They will be planted in your house. You will rejoice in those children. You will rejoice in those children. Wow, our God is so good. Our God is so good. Yeah, he's so, so good. 
We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Lord. I just heard somebody say, somebody here is carrying a lot of pain because of your marriage. Just a lot of pain. A lot of pain. And a lot of that is a spirit of offense. And you've allowed this spirit of offense to turn you into a critic in your marriage. <sighs> I don't know who you are, but the Lord is saying, listen, I want to pull out those arrows right now. I want to pull them out. And I just want to speak over you right now. I sense this is a daughter, not even a son. But I speak over you right now that the Lord is pulling out those arrows right now. In Jesus' name, he's pulling them out, pulling them out. Words that were said, disappointments, frustration. He's pulling it out of your life right now. It's no longer your portion in Jesus' name. The balm of Gilead is flowing over your wounds right now. And the Lord is bringing healing over you. He's bringing healing over you. And what the Lord is saying is you've used your tongue to tear down. It's time to use it to build up. And so go, even today, start to speak those words of love. Even before the feelings come, start to actualize those words. Because love is not a feeling, it's an action. Tell him how much you love him. Tell him you're missing him. Let him know he has a wife who's proud of him. Just begin to speak differently. Sow different words from the ones you've been sowing. And here's a word I have from the Lord from you. Those words are going to take fruit. And your marriage will not only be saved, it will be a fantastic place of joy. Not just for you, but for your children and for your spiritual children as well. And so receive this word. If it's your word, I really sense the Lord is giving that word. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Ah, I don't know why. I just feel like, Pastor Carl, I want to pray for. Did I get boring doing this? I just feel like the Lord wants me to pray for people to, who want to get married. Yeah. It's a place. So if this is you, just raise your hand wherever you are. You can raise your hand, you can kneel down, wherever, wherever it is. Just raise your hand and you're saying, Lord, I, 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 w I want you to locate a good spouse. I bless God. I bless God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for those hands that are raised up right now in faith in the house of the Lord. And Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. That you're such a good God. You're such a caring God. Father God, I pray that you would locate good sons for your daughters and you would locate good daughters for your sons lord my prayer as a father is that they would find each other in this house <laughs> yeah yeah that you'd find this they'd find each other in this house and lord i'm praying for spouses who love god beyond anything else i'm praying that god would give you a spouse who loves god more than you because therein lies your safety when your spouse loves god more than you you're safe because that spouse will always love you because the love they have for you will come from their father and so I pray for you that your spouse will love God more than you that your spouse will love ministry more than you that your spouse will be a partner that will help you achieve your God-given purpose and father because there's anointing in this house right now Lord next November My father, next November, I am now appealing to you as the father of this house. And I want to speak over your children. That Lord, these hands, there will be testimonies. There will be testimonies. There will be testimonies. By next November, Lord, there will be testimonies. I pray that Lord would have so many weddings in this church, we will not know how to handle them. And Lord, I pray that the marriages established in this church, divorce will never be an option. That Lord Jesus, they will be established in the house of the Lord. And they will bear fruit in their old age. And so just receive this. If this is your blessing, just receive it right now. And make sure you testify. Next Leaders Day. We, next, next, we're going to have one in no, November next year. No, ne November next year. We're going to have one. Yeah, yeah, we'll have one in November. Testimony, testimony, testimony. In Jesus' name. Wow. Can we just spend a few, I just, I just feel like we need to just, oh my goodness. What song is that? It just sounds so nice. Please, please, just sing that song. I just feel like we need to just spend a few moments in Jesus' presence, yeah? All of heaven wants your name. Sing louder. Let this place live up to you.
see a desire for prayer overwhelming us Lord we want to see a love for Jesus in our children we want to see a love for Jesus in our homes Lord we want to just love on you we want to draw our hearts to you Lord we don't want to live ordinary lives we want to live lives that are just transfixed by the glory of our father we want to live in your courts we want to dwell in your courts we want to live in your house we want to seek first your kingdom we want your kingdom to break out in our church, yes, break Lord. out in our homes, break out in our marriages, break out in our friendships, break out in our families, Lord, break out in our siblings, break out everywhere around us, Lord. We want to see your kingdom come. We want to see your kingdom come. We want to see your kingdom come. Lord, we love you. That's as simple as it is, Lord. We just love you. We're so committed to you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing in this world that compares to you. I pray that, Lord, you would set our hearts on fire. I pray that, Lord, a revival of prayer would break out in this church. 
I pray that, Lord, a revival of love for Jesus would break out in this yes, church. Lord. I pray that, Lord, you'd wake us up in the middle of the night to seek you and to pray because we'd be so caught up with things about you, Lord. I pray that you'd warm our hearts towards you, that, Lord, none of us would be in a religious space. All of us would be in a relationship space. That's our prayer, Lord. I pray that, Lord Jesus, sin would become so ugly to us. It would not even be something attractive to us. I pray that none of us would be able to stand sin near them. That, Lord, we would make every effort to live a life of righteousness, helped by your Holy Spirit. And I pray that, Lord Jesus, you would just prepare a table for yourself in this church, a place where you are welcome. I pray that, Lord, every Mavuno church will become an altar of the Most High. An altar is a place that is a portal to heaven, a place where angels go up and down, a place where God's will is done without any hindrance. And I pray that, Lord, every Mavuno church will become an altar. But Lord, we pray not just for our church, we pray for our homes as well. And I pray that every Mavuno home will become an altar of the Most High. I pray that, Lord, there will be a prayer room in every house in this church, Lord. And that, Lord, as your people pray, that, Lord, angels would operate uninterrupted in our homes. That demons would have no space in our homes in Jesus' name. I pray that people would walk into our houses and be healed just by walking into our hosts, into our spaces. Because God's presence has gone before us. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you'd bring such a righteousness in us. That, Lord, young people would walk in purity in this church. That, Lord Jesus, would walk in ways that just even confront the world. And people would see us and they would say, surely there's a God. And Lord, we pray for love in this church. I pray that, Lord, you'd help us to be a family. I pray that you would help us to love one another. I pray that the spirits we've talked about, Lord, right now we say they are defeated in Jesus' name. You've given us authority over every principality and every spiritual force. And so right now, standing on that authority, Lord, as a family, we come and say the spirit of strife, you're defeated in Mavuno Church. Depart and go to the place Jesus prepared for you. I say the spirit of orphan spirit, you're defeated in Jesus' name. We loosen your hold over God's people. We cast you to the hell fire to do with what Jesus has intended for you. Ah, spirit of independence and isolation, we break your hold on God's people. We bind you right now. We cast you to the place God created for you. Spirit of criticism, we destroy your hold in our families, in our lives. Our mouths will not be used to tear down. They will be used to build up in Jesus' name. And we declare that that spirit is broken right now in Jesus' name. We declare hell fire on it. And we bind it and cast it out of our homes in Jesus' name. I pray that our homes will be places of beauty. Our conversation will be peppered with the Holy Spirit. Even our marriages will just be places of love and joy. Our relationship with our children will be blessed. Our relationship with our parents will be blessed. Everything around us will be blessed as we walk with you, Lord. So yes, Lord, Spirit, break out. Heaven, come down. We abandon ourselves to you. And we can't wait to see what you're about to do. Lord, these are the most exciting days of our life. Because we know you're about to do things that only God can do. And so, Lord, we say our hearts are ready for you. Our hearts are ready for you. We bless you, Lord, and we thank you. For we ask these things in Jesus' mighty name and God's people say it. Amen. Somebody give glory to God. Woo! Amen. Amen. King Amen. Jesus, all our pain we're lifting high. Your glory.